Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm happy to welcome you to today's ITV Academy webinar. Euromonitor International will present its latest data on the sharing economy and its impact on the travel industry. I'm pleased to welcome Mr. Walter Gertz, who's the travel analyst of Euromonitor International. Mr. Gertz, thank you for being here with us today. Thank you very much, Jessica, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar today. Um, today's webinar will be, um, as already introduced, about the sharing economy, um, looking at how the sharing economy is impacting the travel industry and especially the lodging industry, and we'll have a look at the challenges and opportunities this brings. So starting the presentation, to first uh, quickly introduce Euromonitor for those unfamiliar with the company. Um, we offer a broad range of industry and consumer data and analysis and provide yearly qualitative and quantitative data on hotels, uh, airlines, um, and booking behavior for um, 150 countries. Um, and, and we also provide travel flows for um, up to 210 countries. So in today's presentation, I will first have a look at the current state of the travel industry to see how um, how far the sharing economy has come over the past years. And after that, I will highlight a number of drivers um, which have boosted the strong growth of the sharing economy. And we will see how the hotel industry is responding to the strong growth of the sharing platforms, like, for example, Airbnb and HomeAway. And, and finally, I'll provide um, a look into the future by highlighting some of the important upcoming trends which will shape the industry. So first of all, Let's have a look at the global performance of the travel industry. Now, 2014 was a very good year um, as inbound arrivals increased by 4% globally. Um, domestic trips rose by 7% globally. And hotel room nights um, grew by 5%. Now, in this slide, we can see that um, value sales for lodging are dominated by hotels. Um, chained and independent hotels together account for almost two-thirds of, of total sales. We also see that private rentals, which are now becoming synonymous with peer-to-peer -peer platforms like, for example, like I already said, Airbnb and HomeAway, um, only actually account for 7% of the total lodging sales in 2014. Now, it's, it's important to, to just define what we at Euromonitor see as, as private rentals. So we classify private rentals as um, short-term rentals, which are always privately owned. Um, and, and generally, their pr primary purpose is residential, um, although when you look at home aways, holiday homes, that might not be the case. Um, but they're generally, um, their primary purpose is, is purpose is not tourism-based, and, and they're just rented out for tourism purposes, generally by private owners who, um, who would like to make some extra income. Now, the interesting um, thing about private rentals um, is, um, is that we um, have seen a strong growth in uh, recent years, because they have um, shown a very consistent growth that is stronger um, than hotels over the years, um, as you can see in this graph. Now, the average growth over the last seven years for private rentals, um, and this is despite the turn down, um, the downturn sorry, during the economic crisis, um, is actually 8.2% on average every year, which is much higher than hotels average annual growth of 2.9%. So as I already noted, um, private rentals have seen a boost in recent years, um, and this is particularly through trading platforms such as Airbnb and HomeAway, which I'd like to just highlight. Um, as you can see here, HomeAway has been trading since 2005, um, while Airbnb entered the market later in 2008. And both have seen very strong growth in, in the years since they have been operating. Um, and this is what has really boosted the sales of private rentals and, and what has really um, um, put them on the, in the attention of, of pretty much the entire lodging um, industry. Now, HomeAway and Airbnb are part of a, a much larger movement, uh, which is often referred to as, as a peer-to-peer -peer or um, movement or the sharing economy. And I think it's important to understand what these different terms mean um, and how they're related. So I've put together a, a rudimental diagram um, which, which explains the relationship between a number of these terms. So the terms 
peer-to-peer -peer and sharing economy are often used interchangeably, but I think it's important to understand that they're not the same. Um, Peer-to-peer -peer interactions are direct interactions between an owner and a user, or in the case of Airbnb, a host and a guest. Um, these could be facilitated by online platforms like Airbnb, but the interaction is still directly between the host and the guest. Now, this does not complete the sharing economy, though. Um, there are other business models out there which, which also in, could be included in the sharing economy. So we see the business-to-peer model, which includes companies like, for example, Zipcar, um, where a company owns a number of cars, which they then allow peers to share. Um, and we also see a rise in, um, in, in the peer-to-business-to-peer -peer companies, um, as, as you could call them. Um, and and one, of, one example I recently came across was, for example, Park Fire Rent um, at Amsterdam Airport, um, where I'm from, uh, where um, a person flying out of Amsterdam Airport can park their car for free, um, and it's being rented out to an incoming traveler to the Netherlands. So it provides the incoming traveler with a cheaper alternative to traditional renting companies, while well, it provides, um, first of all, free parking, secondly, a commission, and third, a car wash um, for the owner of the car. So the different peers will never meet, um, as the business deals as the middleman taking care of everything. Um, so it's not necessarily a peer-to-peer -peer direct interaction. And these three business models together, I would say, form the sharing economy. Now, also consider that the sharing economy is, is becoming increasingly overlapping with um, the circular economy, which is focused on reusing and recycling everything that we produce. Um, but this is a whole other topic for another day, and I don't have time to go into this now. So today we find the sharing economy in a lot of different shapes and sizes. And beyond accommodation and, and car and ride sharing, uh, we can find sharing companies in, in Wi-Fi, in handyman, in cooking, in uh, crowdfunding and lending. Uh, we find it in energy, solar power. Um, and, and my personal favorite is Louis in the middle there, which is um, public toilets in New York. So we can pretty much share anything nowadays. Okay, so... Having said that, let's have a look at, at the main drivers which have boosted the sharing economy. So there are mainly four drivers to the sharing economy, and people are increasingly interested in what the sharing economy has to offer for um, these four reasons. So first of all, we see um, a, a social aspect to it. Um, the search for authentic and local experiences is growing. Um, and and people, as people interact more and more with machines um, and technology, traveling and tourism is a way for people to make real connections with people in different parts of the world and, and to find these unique um, and, and authentic and local experiences. Secondly, um, there's an environmental reason. Um, with climate change, um, science of climate change becoming stronger and, and people's understanding of, of the human impact on the environment is, is ever increasing, um, people are becoming more interested in reducing their travel-related impacts through carbon offsetting, um, staying in, in greener or eco-friendly hotels, etc., but also by sharing rather than owning goods like a car. And next to the standard three R's, if you like, of, of reduce, reuse, and recycle, we now start to see um, increasingly repair and redistribute as part of this. And then thirdly, um, there's an economic reason, with um, especially the global economic crisis in 2008, which had a major impact on the rise of the sharing economy, um, because people looked for better value for money products um, and, and services as well, um, as well as, um, as extra modes of income, which hosting or sharing products could bring. Finally, um, and very importantly, um, there's a technological reason for the rise of um, the sharing economy. Um, especially mobile technology has, has really pushed sharing into the mainstream. Um, sharing is, is not a new phenomenon, and, and, but technolo technological advancements have, have really allowed for a better matching of supply and demand, um, as well as a, a better fraud prevention through online payment systems. So it's important to understand the importance of especially technology, I think, um, on the enabling of the sharing economy, so I want to just highlight this a little bit more. Um, 
it's especially the amount of people using the internet which has grown very rapidly. Um, less than two billion people had access to the internet five years ago. Um, and this has already increased to almost 3 billion by now. So in five years, 1 billion extra u internet users. And it is set to, to continue to grow to almost um, 4.5 billion by 2030. And as you can see um, here from this graph, um, strong growth in internet users was registered in, in the past 15 years. Um, and, and areas like North America and Australasia are becoming closer to, to saturation, actually. But again, there's also still major room to grow in, in other, other areas. So the rise of the Internet, together with some of the elements mentioned earlier, like climate change and, and, and the global recession, um, has arguably shaped and is still shaping a consumer base which is not open to the idea of sharing. And in marketing circles, this consumer base is, is generally referred to as Generation Y or Millennials. Now, this group of consumers is, is born between 1980 and 2000, um, and it's, it's, the, it's branded as the first truly global generation. And millennials represent over 25% of the global population, as you can see here, and they're becoming increasingly wealthy as they start to move up the career ladder. Um, they're often described as inquisitive, critical, uh, individual, autonomous, and, and they have very high expectations of their life and the institutions around them. But having said that, we should not make the mistake to understand millennials as all the same. Um, as they are a global generation, there are major differences between millennials from different regions and countries. So here, for example, millennials in all European countries uh, met by their number and, and their income. And there are certain countries like, uh, for example, Switzerland um, and, and the Scandinavian countries where the average income of millennials are relatively high, but the amount of millennials that are actually living there is rather low. Then you also have countries where there's a lot of millennials, um, but their average income is relatively low. So for example, in Russia and Turkey, that's the case. So when you want to focus your marketing campaigns or um, your strategy on millennials from specific countries, at the moment, the countries in the circle will be most interesting as the millennials in these countries um, have the income to travel um, and the potential consumer base is, is relatively large and these are um, maybe unsurprisingly the five large European countries. Now other consumer research undertaken by Euromonitor um, found that there are seven different consumer groups of which three are predominantly relevant to the millennial generation. And as you can see um, that being part of the millennial generation does not mean that they have the same or even similar consumer behaviors. Uh, undaunted strivers, for example, um, will consume to enhance their status and image. Um, so they use the internet and social media for selfies um, or even braggies, which, which is a, an interesting term that was coined a few years ago um, when they are on holidays, uh, bragging, bragging about, about it on social media. They're concerned about the environment, um, and, and so they might drive an electric car, but when they go to a hotel or, or stay at a, at a private rental, they might not actually reuse their, their towels because this is a less visible um, action. Now, in contrast, impulsive spenders will use social media more to stay in touch with friends uh, rather than showing off, and sustainability plays a smaller role as, as the buying impulse can overrule any doubts about the ethicality or sustainability of a purchase. Finally, we have, for example, the independent skeptic, um, which dislike shopping for uh, shopping sake. Um, they li dislike consuming just to consume. They, they, they pride themselves on being unique. They, they dislike mainstream brands. and They like technology, but wouldn't buy it to be cool or, or to belong to, to a certain group. So while they're all very different in their behavior, um, there are a number of common traits, which I've already mentioned before, which are very important here, and that is that they're all very tech-savvy, um, and they're open to collaborative consumption or sharing. So as our research shows, millennials are um, most likely to use the internet and social media sites um, to, to, follow website, uh, to follow companies, sorry, to buy products on, on websites, and to review companies as well. And millennials have a significant impact um, on the world of travel bookings. More and more travelers, and particularly millennials, are using the internet 
to their benefit. Um, they use online travel agencies like, for example, here in Expedia, and um, they use uh, meta search engines like Travado or Kayak or Skyscanner um, to find the best price, but also to explore destinations they might not have considered before. Um, review websites are used to get a better idea of the quality of accommodation. And social media is an influencer, as I already mentioned, um, particularly with people increasingly posting selfies um, on the beach saying, look where I am, uh, to show friends where they're holidaying. And while this offers many opportunities for the travel industry, it, it also means that the booking process is increasingly based on price, um, on location, on a rating score a review by um, an anonymous person, um, and by photos made by peers. So the brand, and this is particularly important for the more established hotel brands, is becoming commoditized and is becoming less important. So let's see how hotels are responding to the ch changing consumer demands and then the rise of the sharing platforms. Now, just to give a, a small recap, um, as I already mentioned, the two major players in the lodging segment at the moment when it comes to private rentals are Airbnb and HomeAway. And these players have been growing rapidly, um, but there's still some ways off the sales made by the global hotel chains, as you can see here. Um, the reason to take note of course, it is the strong growth that's registered especially by Airbnb, um, which saw a compounded annual growth rate. So that's an average annual growth rate. Over the last five years of, of over 250%, um, while HomeAway in the same time grew by 29% uh, on average every year. And this is a lot higher than, than the growth rates registered by more established hotel companies, as you can see. Now, investment bank um, Piper Jafar furthermore estimates that Airbnb will make value sales of uh, 19 billion U.S. dollars by the end of 2019, um, which would make it the fourth largest lodging provider in today's value terms. So definitely a player to be reckoned with. So hotels have been trying to stop the rise um, of, of sharing platforms in many places by lobbying with governments. Um, as they argue that private rentals are often illegal or, or unfair competition. Um, this tactic has so far proven successful in some countries, but very unsuccessful in others. Um, there are cities like Amsterdam, London, Paris, just to name a few, which have been very hospitable um, to the likes of Airbnb, and, and these cities have, have all changed their law to accommodate for Airbnb. But then, uh, on the other end, the, there are some cities um, which have, have seen court cases, fines um, against Airbnb, like New York and Barcelona, where um, Airbnb is really struggling to, to, um, to comply with, with what the legislators want. That doesn't mean that they're not performing very well. New York is the second largest market for Airbnb, and they just find, a lot of, they find it hard to crack um, the legislative part of, of the market. So as fighting provides mixed results, um, we see a lot of hotel chains adapting uh, their approach to benefit from changing consumer demands themselves. And these approaches um, by hotels can be divided in, in broadly four strands. Um, I've, I've put them in, in these four strands. And I'll, I'll just go through these um, with some examples one by one. So firstly, we see players like Hyatt um, and, and Wyndham, and they're investing in smaller peer-to-peer -peer players. Um, so Wyndham invested in Love Home Swaps, and, and Hyatt has invested in One Fine Stay uh, to benefit from a strong growth that is expected. Um, for those who are unfamiliar with these brands, Love Home Swap is, a, is a, as the name says, a home swapping um, platform, whereas One Fine Stay is, is a luxury um, private rental um, platform. Now, for the hotel company, this is a way to obviously benefit from the strong growth um, and the dividends that, that will bring, um, but it's also a way to influence the direction that these companies will take and, and um, maybe integrate some of, of the hotel services into um, the sharing platforms. Then, um, rather than trying to fight peer-to-peer -peer platforms like Airbnb in, in their own backyard, um, hotels are also trying to offer 
um, millennial, especially millennials, an alternative to private rentals, which, which they hope will attract um, the younger consumer. So major buzzwords in the industry at the moment um, are authenticity and individuality of hotels, um, which is what travelers are, are looking for nowadays. So Hilton, for example, has announced two new brands, Curio and Canopy, to play their authenticity card. Um, Intercontinental Hotels Group has um, bought Kimpton Hotels because Kimpton is really known for their very authentic boutique hotels. Um, the brand I want to highlight here, though, is, is um, really targeting millennials um, very clearly, and, and it's trying to draw them away from platforms like Airbnb, um, and, and this is Moxie by, by Marriott Hotels. Now, Moxie Hotels is, is in, was introduced by Marriott in 2013. Um, it's, it's at the lower end of their luxury segment. Um, it was developed in cooperation with IKEA, and it, it doesn't have room service or service restaurant, which you normally would expect from a married hotel. Um, instead, it's, it's opting for a self-service bar and, and little shop, as you can see in, in the bottom left picture here. Um, the bedrooms are, are rather small for, for Marriott uh, standards, and this is because they expect their guests not to sit in their bedrooms, but um, to enjoy the, the living room style communal areas um, that they have on, on, on the ground floor. I mean, and in all areas, very importantly, of the hotel, there, there's a focus on connectivity through um, mobile and online check-in, um, they have high-speed Wi-Fi throughout the hotel, and there are smart TVs in the bedrooms, and they have built-in USB ports as well. So um, to, keep, to continue with, with Marriott and then how they are trying to attract these, um, these younger consumers which are really um, enjoying the sharing economy, um, I'd like to highlight as well that Marriott goes further than that. And um, to stem the commoditization of their brand, um, as I discussed before, the chain has formed a production studio, um, which is now turning out story-driven content marketing um, on its YouTube channels. Um, for example, recently they, they, um, they released a, a movie about Paris and the romance in Paris. And, and rather than focusing on the Marriott brand and, and what they have in their hotels in Paris, they focus on Paris as a destination and staying in a Marriott um, to explore Paris. And it's, it's a different way of, of storytelling and, and getting your brand name out there and it's something that really um, speaks to the younger consumer. Um, what they also do is, is they um, are, have a very big presence on social media platforms like Twitter, for example, here. You can see they use um, actors um, to, to promote their brand. Finally, um, what we also see that hotels are doing is an, an interesting new developments are happening in the hotels itself. Um, as hotels see that millennial consumers enjoy technology to en enhance their experiences, um, hotel companies are increasingly implementing technology in the hotels um, and, and they're producing apps to, to enhance the booking process and, and the check-in process. Um, this is a way for hotels to distinguish themselves from private rentals um, with individual Airbnb hosts maybe not necessarily um, having the resources to implement the latest technology in their rentals, and whereas hotels do have, that, do have those resources. So Starwood has really been a front runner in this segment, um, and, and the chain has had some publicity with the first keyless entry application for smartphones, um, and it's been introducing um, apps like, um, for, for example, for the Apple Watch. Um, and it has also introduced Butler, uh, which is, you might have heard of the robot Butler, um, which can check in guests and, and, and deliver items to, to guest rooms and then do more of the menial tasks. Now, Butler is currently a very nice gimmick, a, a bit of a marketing stunt, um, but in the future, it could have the potential to, um, for example, take over housekeeping tasks, and, and that would really start um, a whole new discussion about the changing role of, of hotel staff in, 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 um, in hotels and, and, and how we interact as humans with other humans or, or um, technology. Um, and, and again, this is something for another day in another presentation. So as we've seen um, how the sharing economy has grown um, and what hotels are currently doing to benefit from uh, changing consumer demands, I think it's interesting to consider how these trends will develop over the coming years and, and decades. Um, so in the short to midterm, 
um, we can expect that the sharing economy continues to grow um, and, and will become a force in the luxury segment. Um, at present, it's mainly the lower end hotels um, that are impacted by sharing platforms. And this is set to change as, as average household incomes is expected to grow in the coming five years in all regions, as you can see in this graph. Now, this will increase the demand for private rentals, which can offer the luxury lifestyle. And already today, we see some very successful companies like um, what I already mentioned, One Fine Stay, um, as well as um, Canadian Luxury Retreats. Um, that have both entered the market and have been very successful in, in, um, in, in different funding rounds. Furthermore, more established companies like HomeAway um, have now um, are really focusing on the luxury segment, and HomeAway, for example, has its own luxury sub-brand um, through luxury rentals. We also see that Asia is the next frontier, um, with all sharing economy eyes moving to the east. Um, especially China, um, with a, a vastly growing economy um, and a massive consumer base. It's very interesting um, for sharing um, companies, but also very challenging. Um, it will be interesting to see how major Western players like Airbnb and, and Uber and HomeAway will fare in China, because um, they'll have to compete with local copycats, um, which can be expected to receive preferential treatment from the Chinese government um, all the way. And finally, we, we can expect to see other Internet pioneers entering the sharing economy. Um, Facebook is, is the number one social media platform um, with um, over 1 billion active users per month. Um, and, and they have already launched a peer-to-peer -peer payment facility on their website. Um, and, and we can expect this to grow in the future. Amazon um, is investing heavily in its presence in, in the local home services marketplaces, um, which it launched earlier this year in the U.S. Um, so people will be able not only to buy products, but actually to, to rent services like a handyman through Amazon. Um, and this can be expected to, to, be, um, to be rolled out in, in different regions and different countries. EB has the resources and the platforms to also become a larger player in the accommodation segment, um, as there are already private rentals for sale on the platform. And if eBay would decide to invest in this segment, it could become a very strong contender in the market. And finally, Apple has introduced Apple Pay recently. Um, that might be a first step towards, um, towards Apple becoming bigger also in the peer-to-peer -peer payment uh, segment uh, in the future. So those are some of the entrants that, that um, have the facilities and have the resources to really become major players in the sharing economy in the coming years if they choose to do so. So what will the future of lodging and travel industry look like then? Um, how will the sharing economy impact the status quo over the coming decades, and then how will it impact especially um, the lodging and the travel industry? Now, at present, we see really broadly two accommodation segments. Firstly, on the left, we have the traditional accommodation providers, like hotels, timeshare, hostels, uh, serviced, self-catering apartments. On the right, we have the strongly growing peer-to-peer -peer platforms, uh, providing spare rooms, home swaps, uh, holiday homes, as, as I've discussed before. And very similarly to that, we see that these accommodation providers are serviced by two types of public transport, um, with guests being able to use mass transportation or more collective or, or sharing transportation. So on the mass transportation side, we have um, the rail, the bus, the air, uh, the taxi, and, and, and maybe sea or river, whereas on the shared transportation we have car sharing, uh, we have ride sharing, we have bike sharing. Now, while there is overlap and, and some consolidation happening at the moment, as I've already pointed out, there's a very strong divide between these blocks, um, with particularly the traditional blocks um, really fighting the peer-to-peer -peer blocks in, in what they're doing. So in the next, say, 15 years, um, what, will we, what we will see is, is um, and what we can expect is a lot of consolidation. So this is expected to lead to the formation of hubs or amalgamations of, of lodging providers. Um, and, and I think it's important to explain what I mean by that. So 
um, it will expectedly result in, in one or two possibilities. On, on the one hand, it might mean that business hotels and boutique hotels and private rentals, timeshare, uh, hostels and, and holiday villas, etc., will all come together in, in one geographical place, and they'll be closely serviced by retail and entertainment spaces around there. On the other hand, and secondly, what is a possibility is that uh, geographical proximity might be less relevant um, as, as different lodging providers in a city or neighborhood um, will all be serviced still from one hub, um, and, and, but then the hub will be the main area with, for example, where, where travelers can, do, um, can find a key collection, they can find concierge services, uh, airport transfers will, will go from that hub. Um, and then we'll all be directed to this central hub um, before people disperse into their um, different accommodations. So however this will express itself, um, either way, I think consolidation is, is definitely due. Um, we can expect to particularly see consolidation between um, traditional and, and then peer-to-peer -peer players, um, but also within these two um, within these two blocks. And the, the fact that um, there's major story still going on on, on whether Starwood is going to be bought up by any of, of their competitors, um, and, and the fact that Marriott, which is according to our data the largest um, largest hotel player um, in, in value sales terms, and, and the fact that they only have five percent of the market shows that consolidation is definitely due. Now, these hubs will be surfaced, to, to get back to the hubs, will be serviced by a mixture of, of mass and, and shared transportation options. And we can call this a multimodal network. So people will no longer rely on, on one form of transportation to get to their destination and um, to get around. Um, it's, it's all about convenience and, and, and filling in certain gaps that currently exist in a traditional transportation system. So instead, and, and we can already see this actually with the benefit of mobile applications. Um, for example, in London where I'm based, we have some great applications which, um, which are, allow you to do this. You can see people planning their routes um, by using more than one form of transportation. Peer-to-peer um, -peer transportation will, will need to be combined with mass transportation because the amount of people that will travel will, will continue to increase and, and, um, and, and gaps, like I said, will need to be filled in. Okay, so let's continue for a little bit longer on our exploration of 2030 um, and, and see in, in what ways the world will change and then what will be the next trends and, and, and focus areas that you should be focusing on. Now, importantly, by 2030, um, it's not just millennials we're talking about anymore. By 2030, today's millennials will be aged between 30 and 50 years old, um, and, and a new generation already known as, as Generation Alpha will be entering the workplace. And at that point, over half of the population will have access to the Internet, and 70% of all mobile phones will actually be smartphones. So connectivity will become standard, and, and travelers will not believe that today Wi-Fi is not available everywhere 24 hours 7 a day. So furthermore, responsible tourism sustainability will become a must, um, and this is driven by our understanding and the effects of, of global warming um, and strongly increasing population numbers. All the things that I've discussed before as, as current trends by then will be commonplace and, and, and definitely a must for doing business. And by 2030, the world will be predominantly urban. Over 5 billion consumers will be living in cities. Um, and not only does the increase in people mean that more people will travel and, and responsible tourism will become a must, which it also means there will be a boost for the sharing economy. Um, as we know that sharing practices mostly take place in densely populated areas, um, and this will be held further if cities become overcrowded, um, and sustainability and, and the sharing of goods will be, will be paramount to coexistence. We know that we now have around 30 megacities, um, which are cities with more than 10 million people living in it, um, and, and a further three will be added between now and 2030, which you can see in the orange. This clustering around small geographical areas throws up many issues for citizens um, and also for policymakers. Um, major investments in infrastructure are needed now and in the future to, to accommodate for all these people. 
sharing brands can help with um, a large amount of tourists. And, and we've, we've already seen this in, for example, Brazil when, when they hosted the World Cup where Airbnb was um, an, an alternative accommodation provider um, officially recognized by um, the Brazilian government. Um, and, and they can also uh, improve the transportation network to deal with overcapacity. However, we also see examples of cities where private rentals are actually flooding the market. Now, for example, in Barcelona and New York, um, where there's real problems for the established um, hotel industry um, because it's negatively impacting um, their um, revenues and, and, and um, the price that they can charge. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's something to consider. It is very important that in the future a balance can be struck between supply and demand and, and traditional and, and sharing providers um, both should be part of this and we need to move towards discourse where stakeholders get around the table to discuss the issues that, that I've discussed today um, because perceiving the sharing economy just as a solution on the one hand or just as a problem on the other hand is, is not the way forward. Um, the sharing economy is here to stay, um, but we need to find ways to integrate it effectively and efficiently with um, the more established infrastructure. So I hope that these points will help to start your thinking um, about what is currently happening and what are the current trends, but also what will come next. Um, where are the challenges and opportunities in the future? And, and, um, and, and let me just summarize today's presentation with some uh, key takeaways to, fi to finalize this. So first of all, brand commoditization is a real threat, um, which will continue to evolve as, as Internet users continue to grow and online tools will continue to improve the booking process. Um, but having said that, um, brands will become less important when booking. It should also be noted that it does open up a world of opportunities as, as more people can be reached at a significantly reduced cost, which if you know how to reach them um, would be very beneficial. Secondly, millennials will offer many opportunities as their disposable incomes will grow. Um, they'll become older and get children. Um, Every the global generation, they're not only very different from previous generation, but also within themselves, they're a heterogeneous group. Um, so targeting the millennial consumer as it is um, might be easier said than done. Um, and, and I've shown some differences in their behavior. And get ready for Generation Alpha. Uh, everything that we currently see as, as emerging trends or just starting trends like the technology in hotels, the mobile bookings, wearable devices like the Apple Watch, um, responsible tourism, um, eco hotels, using social media as a, as a marketing tool, all this will become a prerequisite of doing business with this group of consumers and, and, a, and a clear must. Then the sharing economy is expected to become more professional um, over the coming years and, and major companies will enter this market. Um, it will also become increasingly global um, with, with companies' um, reach increasing. And expect to see an increase in uh, consolidation. So at present, the lodging industry is very fragmented, um, and this will start to turn around. Um, it will bring many opportunities, but it will also bring challenges, as I've shown. And finally, the future lies in cities as urbanization and hyperconnectivity form major hubs of activity. Um, expect higher disposable incomes um, of people living in cities. Expect more tra city travel, um, but also expect overcrowding and the need for smarter and better solutions. So sharing as a concept provides certain solutions to some of these problems, um, but there's a need for a strong discourse and, and, and stakeholder um, interaction um, to, to be able to effectively integrate the sharing brands with the establishment. So thank you very much for listening today. Um, I hope this presentation has provided you with some food for thought. Um, we have some time to answer a few questions, um, so please, if you can use your Q&A box on your screen and, and ask away, and then um, we will answer whatever question we can, but if any questions, um, I either don't have the time or need some further research, we, can, we will answer all those by email later. Thank you very much. Okay, so we have our first question. Um, the question is, what are your expectations regarding the future of hotels in the area of the sharing economy? Um, 
That's a very good question, um, and, and I've, I've highlighted some things that the hotels have been doing. I think um, hotels don't have to be um, too worried about their product um, if they're willing to change. Um, we can clearly see that, that the, the demands for, for um, off people are changing. Um, travelers want different things, and we can already see that hotels um, are um, implementing new things. The problem with hotels is that they are very bulky, um, whereas when you look at sharing platforms like Airbnb, they don't actually own any of their rentals, and they are, for them it's easier to, to make changes um, and, and to, to respond to current trends. This is something that hotels will need to address. Um, Implementing or, or, or launching a new brand every time they see a new trend is not the way to do it. Um, I, I highlighted the, the example of Moxie, which I think is a very good example and, and something that I personally believe that would work for Marriott. Um, but to, to keep, keep implementing and then launching new, um, new brands might not be the solution. So I think, I think there's, there's um, definitely um, food for thought for hotels there, but on the other hand, there's still enough people that will always want to stay in hotels because hotels can offer something um, that private rentals might not, um, certain service levels um, and, and certain locations where, where private rentals might not be available. So I think hotels need to, rather than fight um, the sharing economy, they need to, need to have a look and, and see how they can um, benefit from the sharing economy, and, and I've actually written a couple of articles about that, which um, I'm, I'm not sure who asked this question, but we can, we can email you those to you um, just to have a focus on um, collaboration and, and uh, benefiting from the sharing economy rather than um, just looking at how to fight it. Okay, hopefully that, that answers your question. Um, the second question is, are there uniform EU rules concerning sharing economy operators? Um, no, they are not. Um, and, and as I've, I've shown um, in, in one of my slides, um, there is um, definitely um, very much of a difference in approach. And even within the sharing economy, there's a difference of approach. I think Paris is a very interesting example where Paris is the largest, um, when, when you look at listings for Airbnb, Paris is the largest city in the world uh, when it comes to, to private rentals um, for Airbnb. They, the, the Parisian uh, government has, has changed the rules. Um, they've changed the law to, to um, allow Airbnb to, to become a, a major player there. At the same time, Uber, another sharing um, economy um, operator, has very big problems there. So even so, there's a difference between different countries, and then there, uh, for as far as I know, there, there are no EU rules at the moment, which I mean, that, that might obviously change, but in, which um, impact the sharing uh, platforms. But even so, there's a difference between countries, but there's also a difference even within the same city. Um, the approach that different players take towards legislation um, really have an impact on, on how the legislative body works. Um, Airbnb has been very, um, has, has changed their, their approach a little bit. They've been very collaborative, and it's working for them. Uber um, is still very much focusing on, on kicking against the establishment and, and saying, look, here we are, you can't stop us. Um, and in Paris, that definitely didn't work for them because now their, their service is banned there. So um, to, to come back to your question, um, the very quick answer is no, there's no uniform EU rules at the moment. The next question is, um, do you think the millennials' uh, behavior will change in the future as they grow older? Um, yes, I think um, it's, it, it's important to understand um, that millennials are a generation and they do grow up. Um, we're not talking here about um, 20 to 30 year olds. Um, we're talking about a generation that will, will become 30 to 40, 40 to 50. So, um, of course, their behavior will, will change. And, and um, I think when they get children, and, and that obviously is starting now, that, that will change their travel behavior, um, and, and it, it will definitely have an impact. But I think what's important and, and what will not change is some of the, the most important things that I tried to highlight here today about millennials, which is that they're tech-savvy and they're willing to share. Um, they've grown up with technology. They're the first generation that, that are 
um, digitally, digitally savvy and, and have grown up with, with, digi with in the digital age. Um, and they're also the first generation which are um, maybe returning to the sharing um, economy. I mean, uh, the baby boomers after the Second World War were very much focused on, on possessing and, and um, owning products and, and enhancing your status through that because they could and they, they wanted to um, show, that, show or, or push off against the previous generation which has lived through the war. Now we see a return back to um, pre-baby um, boomers, when, if, you, if you like, uh, where millennials are, are willing to share more and um, their behavior will change for sure, but I think um, with the technology ever increasing and, and millennials actually being quite savvy with the technology, I think that they will, um, that will continue and, and, and can only actually improve um, when it comes to the use of technology and, and um, their willingness to share products. The next question is, um, as a researcher in the Middle East researching the sharing economy, uh, how much do you think culture has to do with acceptance and use? Um, I think that's a very, very interesting question and, and, and definitely very relevant. Um, I personally um, have um, less um, information about the Middle East, but I can, I can tell you something um, which, which has exactly the same meaning um, about China, for example. Um, in China, trust is a major issue. Um, I've, I've spoken to many uh, sharing platform providers and, and that are trying to enter the Asian market and especially China. Um, and for them, trust is the major issue. Chinese people, and I don't want to... Um, I don't want to want to say that all people are the same, of course, but um, in general, Chinese people are very um, distrustful. Um, they would not like um, even their neighbors to stay in their house, let alone a complete stranger from a different country. This is a major issue. Um, but then again, with the, the younger uh, generation, this is changing. Um, I think through globalization, um, through possibly westernization. Um, what we can see is, is that cultures are shifting, um, cultures are changing, they might be watering down a little bit. Um, and, and so I think for sure at the moment, culture has a, has a major, is a major um, impactor when it comes to um, accepting, um, accepting the sharing economy. Um, Another point which, which I should point out is, is it's not only um, the hosting part of, of sharing that, that might be an issue with, with trust. And, and, and it, it's also, of course, an issue where um, using the sharing economy as a, as a user, as a, as a guest, um, or as a, as a, as a host, oh, sorry, not as a host, as a guest, um, or as a user, um, which culturally and, uh, and economically has a big impact. Um, when, when I speak about millennials and then how they want to push off against their, the previous generation, um, I obviously am looking through a, a more of a Western, um, Western uh, lens because in other areas in the world, in, in more emerging economies, um, pushing off against the previous generation actually means possessing more and owning more. So I think that's something to take into consideration and, and, and culture and, and, um, and history of a country and, and, and the economic profitability of a country definitely has a, has a major impact on that. Okay, I think at the moment there's no further questions. Um, so I'm going to pass over back to Jessica um, to um, provide you with some more information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Walter. Thank you to all of um, you listening to this very interesting webinar. I think we got a lot of insights uh, today. And, um, yeah, I pass it over to Sean, our WebEx producer, to end the webinar. Thank you.